Good evening, number 531. 531. 531, we'll sing the first and second verses, number 531. Uh, continuing his uh, seminar on creation, number 531. Praise the Lord, give the Lord, give praise. Okay, appreciate again the opportunity to be here. I've lost track. I think this is the fourth session in our seminar uh, on the, the subject of creation. Can, Christians can be confident about creation. So evolution and the Big Bang are the major aspects of the story that naturalists believe explain the whole universe. So evolution and the Big Bang are the primary parts of the naturalistic model, we say. So the, the scientific explanation for, for what has happened throughout the history of the universe. Now, our model obviously differs a lot. It's the story that we would say of what happened historically and, and, and scientifically, and it's called the creation model. And it, of course, again, is very different. So in the previous sessions, or the last, I guess, session, we laid out really the, the, the thrust of what that model entails, the biblical creation account. So the framework that helps us to make sense of the universe around us. And so we looked at, we've looked at evidence that there has to be a God, and specifically that it is the God of the Bible that exists. We looked at evidence that, that shows that the Bible had to have come from God. Humans cannot would not be able to create that book. And then we looked at the guts of what the Bible teaches us about history, especially key events as they would relate to how we make sense of everything. In particular, we, we focused on the biblical flood of Genesis 6 through 9. So the next question I want to look at is, can that model, that framework for how we view the universe, is it able to explain the evidence from science and history? Does it harmonize with the evidence? Can it withstand scrutiny? Can the creation model, as I have described it, be defended as Christians are told to do, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15? And so this session and the next one, I want to spend time answering those questions. And so these sessions will help to show why the previous sessions are important to have clear in your mind because that underlying framework will allow you to give specific responses to explain criticisms that are made against the biblical model. So as we look at the attacks that are being made against creation, you'll hear me several times point back to that model that I laid out in the previous session and giving my answer to those charges. So in this session, I want to, this one and really the next one, I want to spend some time responding to some of Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guys, attacks against creation. Uh, so I, I, I might have mentioned there was a debate a few years ago where Bill Nye squared off against Ken Ham, who was the, or who is the uh, CEO, I guess, of Answers in Genesis, which is probably the largest of the creation organizations, and they had this debate, and uh, the 
first half of the debate went fine. The second half of the debate really didn't go so well for creationists, I would say, because Bill Nye brought up several challenges to the creation model that, that Ken Ham did not really deal with very well. And so it, stand, it really, the kind of questions that Bill Nye brought up, I think, serve as a good uh, framework for showing that really the creation model is able to withstand that kind of scrutiny. And so we're going to take some time to look at that question. So here's what Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, said. So far, Mr. Hamm and his worldview, the creation model, does not have this capability. It cannot make predictions and show results. The big thing I want from you, Mr. Hamm, is can you come up with something that you can predict? Do you have a creation model that predicts something that will happen in nature? So this is a common argument that is being brought up against uh, creation today that, that deserves a response. So it is true that what we call verifiable or falsifiable predictions are important in science. What we, we don't, we're not talking about predictive prophecy like we're foretelling the future. In science, what we mean by that is if you develop a, a theory, let's say, I believe that there is an invisible force that sucks uh, smaller masses towards larger masses, kind of like a big magnet, uh, and I'll call that gravity. Okay, so if I can, I can make predictions based on my theory that can then be tested that will either help provide evidence for my theory or falsify my theory. And so I could say, well, if I'm right, I should be able to drop this remote and it's going to get sucked to the earth because the earth is a, this larger mass and it's going to be able to pull that smaller mass towards it. So I can, I can test that. And I, so I can make a prediction that I can then test. So according to Bill Nye, the creation model can't do that. It's, so it's not really a scientific model. And hopefully you've already seen from the previous sessions that the creation model is actually loaded with science and great explanatory power. And I've even intentionally used the word prediction several times so that you can see the creation model does have this ability to do this. Bill Nye is clearly is unaware of it, as are the bulk of Americans. They, they don't really know the, the science of the creation model and what really undergirds uh, the modern creation model, scientifically speaking. So I want to go ahead and give a few examples that highlight further how the creation model is, in fact, a valid model. It can make predictions based on the Bible that have been, in fact, verified in nature. Uh, and so I really could spend a lot of time on this subject. Uh, I, after that debate, I, I just spent about an hour just jotting down a bunch of predictions that the creation model has been able to make, that, that you would make based on the Bible, that have been verified when you look at the actual evidence in nature. And I wrote a response to the Bill Nye Kinham debate where I go into this much more in depth. We're not going to have time to cover all of these predictions. Uh, again, I do that in this, uh, in, in this article that, that is available for free on our website. Uh, number 11 is covered in a dinosaur day that I present for, for teenagers showing the, the evidences of the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs. So I want to go ahead and just start with number 12. So if the earth is relatively young and humans lived alongside dinosaurs, then we would predict that there would be evidence that the dinosaurs must have been around in the not too distant past, rather than 65 million years ago. Uh, so the evolutionary model would say humans never saw dinosaurs. We were separated by about 63 million years. No human ever saw uh, the dinosaurs in the conventional uh, definition of the term. So interestingly, in the past decade or so, there's been a powerful evidence that has come to light that verifies creationist predictions. Scientists have been cracking open dinosaur fossils that are supposed to be at least 65 million years, some of them even as far back as 200 million years old, and yet they're discovering soft tissue. They're finding collagen, blood, vessel, blood vessels with red blood cells still intact, uh, soft, stretchy, flexible tissue has been found in T-Rex, hadrosaurs, mosasaurs, cetacosaurus, and even your pterosaurs, your flying reptiles, and your, even your marine reptiles like your ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. Obviously, there, there should be no such thing as, as soft material left in these, in these fossils if they did and if they actually are from at least 65 million years ago. So collagen and hemoglobin could last undecayed theoretically 
for thousands of years if you have a cool, dry, sterile, basically a pristine environment, which isn't even where we're finding these fossils in the first place. And, but theoretically, maybe thousands of years, but not millions of years. And so based on this find, it should also come as no surprise that C14 is also being discovered in dinosaur fossils, and there should be no detectable C14 in any fossils that are even 50,000 years old, much less millions and millions of years. So this, this, uh, these recent discoveries verify predictions made by the creation model. All right, there's more I could talk about that. Let's move on to number 13. If the Earth is relatively young, then we'd predict that geological processes that are assumed to take eons that have been conventionally assumed by evolutionists to take eons, like petrification, it would be, we would find that those things actually can occur rapidly. And more and more scientific evidence is coming to light that verifies that prediction. Scientists have dis discovered that the rate that something turns to stone, that, that it's petrified, can be significantly altered by catastrophic events. For example, in 2004, five Japanese scientists published their research on rapid petrification in the secular journal Sedimentary Geology. So they were studying some mineral-rich acidic water from the explosion crater of the Tatsuyama volcano in central Japan. Water runs over the edge of this volcano as a waterfall, and some wood had fallen into the path of this mineral-rich water, and they realized, hey, this, this had to have petrified within 36 years. And so they decided to conduct further experiments, and they found that silica petrification could occur in only seven years. And then a 2004 paper was published on rapid solidification of plants at Yellowstone, and they found that within 11 months, plants had enough solidification that the plant tissues had already been stabilized against collapse and the plant structure had been replicated. So again, modern science verifies creation model predictions. All right, number 14, again, if the Earth is relatively young, then we would predict that evidence will be uncovered, indicating that the layers of the geologic column can form rapidly as well, so that the, that the sediment can be deposited and then lithify rapidly. And one such example comes from polystrate fossils. These are fossils that cut through multiple layers of, of strata, like, for example, this tree or this tree. Now, if those layers take millions of years to be deposited and then to lithify, then you'd have to argue that this tree was, was sticking up out of the ground, and then, it, then its uh, roots got covered up and eventually lithified, while the rest of it is still sticking up out of the ground, undecayed somehow for all that time, which, of course, does not happen. Uh, that would be impossible. But if the sediments that are around the, these trees were deposited rapidly, then it would explain the evidence and verify creation model predictions. The sedimentation rates, of course, are going to be much higher during catastrophic activity like the global flood, and then a, a petrification can happen rapidly as well. Besides trees, there have been uh, calamites that have been found that are polystrate fossils. Those are little small little uh, plants, as well as catfish. And then probably the most famous is this 80-foot-long baleen whale that was found in a diatomaceous earth coria in California. So just one example of a polystrate fossil refutes the claim that sediments take millions of years to be deposited and then lithify. All right, we're having to move, I know, rapidly through this. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Number 15, secular geologists argue that uniformitarianism is true although there is some movement away from strict uniformitarianism, but all evolutionary dating methods are based on the assumption of uniformitarianism. And those techniques are the primary evidences that are used to try to prove the earth is old. And I cover that much more in depth in a, in a different series. But according to uniformitarianism, whatever geological processes you see going on today, you assume that they have always gone on in essentially the same way. Uh, and in the same rate that you see today. So if you see a stream going through a canyon, slowly removing sediment from that uh, canyon, then it's assumed always to have done that at that same slow way. But if the creation model is true, we'd predict that things like canyons could form rapidly, and evidence substantiates that prediction as well. So for example, in March uh, of 1982, a small eruption at the summit of Mount St. Helens caused a massive mud flow 
And within one day, a 20-mile-long, 140-foot-deep canyon was carved. One day. And this occurrence completely destroys uniformitarianism. If uniformitarianism is true, then when you see the stream at the bottom of this canyon, geologists would assume, okay, this stream's been moving through here, and so it took tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years for this canyon to form, and yet they know that this actually was formed in one day. It's called the Little Grand Canyon. It appears to be a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. Uh, the Lake Missoula flood is another well-documented flood from the Ice Age, which even the secular geologists acknowledge. Water breached a, uh, a dam during the Ice Age, and 500 cubic miles of water were released. That's 10 times the combined flow of all the rivers in the world released within two days. It destroyed 16,000 square miles of terrain and cut hundreds of feet through solid rock, creating canyons, carving 50 cubic miles of earth. Number 16, if the earth is relatively young, but evolutionary dating methods say that it's old, we'd predict that evidence would come forth indicating that evolutionary dating methods uh, have some flaws in them, probably in their foundational assumptions. And that evidence has become more and more readily available as well. So evolutionary dating methods are, are built upon at least three fundamental assumptions that have been empirically shown to have major problems with them when you go out and get the actual data. So each of these can be shown to be unreasonable, and there's a good book called The Young Earth uh, by John Morris and Frank Sherwin that provides scientific evidence of that claim. For the sake of time, let's look briefly at just at uh, one of these assumptions in some recent news that highlights why this assumption is wrong. Uh, the assumption being that the nuclear decay rates of the elements have been constant throughout history. So in other words, they assume that you know, uranium is, is gradually uh, turning into lead over time. They assume that that, that rate, uh, that the uranium turns into lead, is a constant rate. But in 2009, CERN, this is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, these are the guys that actually found the Higgs boson particle, the God particle. You might remember that for, from a few years ago. They announced research that indicates the nuclear decay rates apparently are not, in fact, always constant. The decay rate of thorium-228, if it's in water, it's increased by a factor of 10,000 when you have ultrasonic cavitation involved, which is exactly what we'd expect to happen if the flood occurred. So we would predict that the, the, the nuclear decay rates of all of these uh, elements could have been accelerated during the flood. In 2010, <clears throat> research by a team at Purdue was released that discovered that radioactive decay rates appear to vary with the inner workings of the sun. So notice that without this fundamental assumption of constant nuclear decay rates in place, then the radiometric dating methods cannot be used to get the actual age of anything very old uh, with any kind of certainty. And therefore, the primary evidence that is used of an old Earth disappears. These radiometric dating methods are the primary argument for an old Earth, and yet these assumptions have been shown empirically to be bad assumptions. All right, again, we can talk more about that. Let's move on to number 17. Uh, by the way, as I've said before, the, a lot of this material is covered in this book, Flooded, that is actually targeting teens uh, with a lot of this material. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about you'll find in there. All right, number 17. If the Bible indicates that the earth is relatively young, then the creation model would predict that there would be some scientific evidence that would uh, surface that supports that idea, and it has. There's actually many different lines of evidence that point to a young earth, even using the evolutionists' own assumptions. Uh, so, for example, moon recession. The moon is, is receding from the earth at about four centimeters per year at present, but the recession isn't a linear recession. So when it's closer to the earth, it, it would have been faster and moving away and then it's gradually slowing down its recession the further it gets away. So based on the equation that describes the recession rate, scientists can calculate where the moon would have been compared to the Earth at different times in the past. And so we know, for example, that 6,000 years ago, the moon would have been about 800 feet closer to the Earth than it is today, given that equation that describes the motion of the recession. 
and that would be a, not a problem. Uh, but if the moon is as old as they claim it is, it's a major problem. Evolutionists claim that the moon is four and a half billion years old, but only one and a half billion years ago, the moon would have actually been touching the earth. And so it would be physically impossible for it to be any older than that. So they would have to try to explain this by claiming that the recession rate must have been different in the past. But that would then give up on the uniformitarian assumption. But the uniformitarian assumption is what they use to get the old age for, that they need for evolution. So without the uniformitarian assumption, then this proclaimed evidence for an old age of the earth vanishes. So the moon cannot be as old as evolutionists claim using their own assumptions. A six to 8,000 year old moon, which is what is predicted by the creation model is not a problem. Another example in the area of population statistics, evolutionists believe humans have been on the earth for some two to three million years. So the genus Homo, your hominids have been on the earth, they would say that long. <clears throat> so using statistical equations, we can get an estimate of how many people should be on the earth if that were true. So given very conservative estimates, accounting for disease, war, famine, and so forth, and also assuming that humans have only been on the earth for one million years rather than two to three million years, there should be 10 to the 2,000 people on the earth today. Now, you really probably cannot fully even grasp how big that number is, okay? So to try to grasp that number, consider that the known universe is 28 billion light years in diameter. Uh, so if you took miniature humans that are three feet tall with narrow shoulders and you packed them into the universe like sardines, you could only squeeze 10 to the 82nd power people into the whole universe, now notice that leaves quite a few more humans that have got to be packed somewhere, a ridiculous number of humans, in fact, enough to completely pack 10 to the 1,918 other universes like ours to completely fill up that many more universes. And remember, these are calculations based on humans only being around for 1 million years, not 2 to 3 million years. So if it's argued, well, there just really couldn't be that many people, because there just wouldn't be enough resources. And so all those extra people would just start dying off somewhere around 50 billion, which is what they would say the Earth's capacity is. Okay, then there should be evidence that that capacity has been reached long ago, many times. And therefore, there should be billions upon billions of hominid fossils that we're stumbling around on proving that contention. And yet the evolutionists themselves acknowledge they don't even have enough to fill one coffin. And so where's all the bones that would, be, uh, that would explain uh, uh, the, the, uh, the humans, uh, the hominids' existence? It's just not reasonable, the mathematical the gymnastics that have to be done to try to make this work. Now, if we adjust our calculations based on our contention that the creation model is true, we would argue that about 4,350 years ago, six people began the repopulation of the earth, if you don't include Noah and his wife. And if that's the case, there should be about 6.7 to 8.1 billion people on the planet today, which, of course, is very close to what we actually see. Another example, scientists have been measuring the Earth's magnetic field decay with precision since 1835, and they've determined that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying with a half-life of about 1,100 years. So again, if we use their assumption of uniformitarianism, and we calculate back in time, and we double the Earth's magnetic field intensity every 1,100 years, you get to a point 30,000 years ago when the Earth's magnetic field would have been so strong that the field would have been comparable to a neutron star. It would have created immense heat that would have been catastrophic to the Earth. Earth's internal structure likely couldn't have even sustained that immense heat. It'd be impossible for life to be able to exist, again, just 30,000 years ago, and yet evolutionists say that life has been around for 3.8 billion years. Again, if the earth is young, as the creation model would predict, there's no problem to dodge here. So lots of different scientific techniques are, are available that actually, again, using the evolutionists' own assumptions, that actually verify a young age for the earth, which is what is implied in the Bible. And again, we could, we could go into this much more in depth. I've got material on our, on our website about this subject as well. Number 18, evolution predicts that life has evolved 
into more complex forms. And intelligence has gradually increased over time, starting with a single-celled organism and then moving towards the, the apes and then moving towards humans and the state of consciousness we enjoy today. So ancient man is depicted as unintelligent. These are dumb cavemen grunting and beating things with, with clubs, which is kind of how we are really today, it seems like. <laughs> we seem to be digressing uh, from an evolutionary perspective, but incapable of intelligent thought, and then uh, really only developing more sophisticated technology as the brain evolves enough to allow him, right? So that's the evolutionary uh, kind of perspective. Man's brain and genes, we would say from a creation perspective, we would say that man's brain and genes were, were pristine at the very beginning. So we would say that's actually opposite of what the evolutionists would say. The original humans would have been without any genetic defect or mutation. His ability to think and reason probably exceeded our own. Uh, man before the flood was, was already capable of amazing feats because humans were living for hundreds of years, and you see some allusion to this there in Genesis chapter 4, the things that humans were already able to do in a short amount of time. Uh, the Bible verifies that they're already intelligent, Cities are being built by the time of Adam's grandson, and also apparently during the lifetime of Adam, men are already building, uh, using tents, having livestock, uh, developing musical instruments, and even working with bronze and iron. These are practices that are thought to have taken hundreds of thousands of years for humans to develop, but the biblical model would say humans already were able to do this toward the, the very beginning. So the evolutionary model would predict a, a continual increase in human advancement and, intelligent and intelligence and enlightenment as humans evolve. The creation model would predict that advancement really doesn't have as much to do with intellect or intelligence. Entropy is going to play a major role. So as the human genome continues to degenerate over time, our bodies and brains aren't capable of doing what they would have been capable of 6,000 years ago. And so we'd predict a gradual decline in some things, uh, some aspects of humanity. But also, number two, we would predict that human advancement has to do uh, especially with the state of a society. So the decisions that its leaders are making, whether the society creates an atmosphere that encourages learning and research and exploration, how free a society is to exercise the talents that God gave us. And of course, whether or not a society is behaving in a way where God will bless that society, right? Which the Bible, of course, makes very clear. Uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So advancement would be up and down at different times throughout history. And of course, when a society collapses, you'd expect much of that advancement to just come to a screeching halt. Many times it would disappear. And sure enough, the more archaeologists have dug around, the more amazing things have been discovered in areas that are, for example, now third world countries. And yet, clearly, they had amazing abilities that we still don't even understand today. Uh, amazing architecture and structures are still a mystery as to how they were able to create these. For example, archaeologists have under, uncovered evidence of advanced ancient human intelligence from all over the world, ancient boats that are able to hold many people, precise maps, advanced astronomy, even though they didn't have the tools that we have today, uh, chemistry, hydraulic, engin uh, hy hydraulic engineering, weaponry. There's solid evidence that indicates the Noskin people of Peru that were flourishing 2,000 years ago they were already able to perform successful skull surgery to relieve pressure on the brain from battle wounds. They were also able to build a sophisticated system of aqueducts, many of which are still functioning today, 2,000 years later, called Puquios. Ancient towers, ziggurats, pyramids have been found all over the world, abilities which societies had, and then the technology often disappeared with the collapse of that society, only to be uncovered by archaeologists hundreds or thousands of years later. The Noskin people, again flourishing some 2,000 years ago, were able to draw these enormous, what are called geoglyphs. They're basically enormous pictures on the ground, pictures that are so enormous that, that many of these were not even discovered until we had the ability to fly over them. And so these, these little lines are actually roads, and yet they made these huge structures and in fact, they were featured on the fourth Indiana Jones uh, movie, actually. 
All right, in the 1930s, archaeologists discovered ancient batteries, proving that people in Baghdad knew how to make batteries as early as 250 B.C. Uh, in 2006, the New York Times ran a piece announcing the discovery of ancient Peruvian canals used for irrigation farming, and they're thought to be four to 5,000 years old. This goes all the way back beyond uh, Moses, even to Abraham. Uh, Craig Morris of the American Museum of Natural History he said their use of slope and management of water flow shows again that ancient people were a lot smarter and more observant than we often give them uh, credit for. Well, again, because that goes against the evolutionary paradigm. Of course, ancient man is not given that credit. It doesn't fit their model. Humans, though, have always been intelligent. The creation model would predict that that has always been the case, even in ancient times. So uh, how do we make sense of the amazing technology we have today? Well, it's true that that uh, we have a lot of advanced technology. That doesn't mean that humans have gotten smarter. If you really think about it, the primary discoveries that have caused the technological progress we've really only enjoyed over the last, say, 200 years, so that the ability to harness electricity, telephones, the internal combustion engine, uh, airplanes, computers, these, these things can be traced back in general to just individuals that either accidentally stumbled across a discovery or design something after many, 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 many trials and failures. So it wasn't about humans being more evolved. Now, after discovering something, humans are really good at building on that discovery and inventing new things, and we have more people on the planet today, and since we can communicate better than pr presumably any other time in history, then that allows progress to, to just boom quickly. But the primary essential discoveries that, that sparked the technology that we have today were really lucky breaks, or, or as we would probably say it, providential blessings uh, when you actually look into that. So imagine if the pre-flood world had stumbled across the ability to harness electricity. Who knows what they would have been able to do in building on that knowledge when you think about how long they were living. All right, number 19, since the Bible mentions giant humans, we'd predict that there might be evidence surfaced that supports that claim. And uh, so are giants a mythical idea? Apparently not, according to evolutionists. Uh, the popular science podcast that is called The Naked Scientists, yes, that's weird, uh, this is put out by Cambridge University. They conducted an interview with Lee Berger in 2007. This guy is the paleoanthropologist of the University of Edvardersron in South Africa, and he's been in the news a lot over the last decade because he found Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi, which are the two big fossil finds from really the last decade. So this group had an opportunity to visit his fossil collection at the university where he, he's a professor, and they discussed the fossils of the museum. So in the article following the interview, Chris Smith, the editor, he said, one of the most interesting things that the fossil record reveals is that we went through a period of extreme giantism. These were people routinely over seven feet tall. They were huge, he said. So Berger said, you've probably heard the myth that uh, ancient humans were tiny, and some of them were tiny, but as we move through the period of 0.5 million to 300,000 years ago in Africa, this is to, uh, you have to convert this to the biblical frame, we would say this is right before Abraham, uh, and it's more like uh, 4,300 years ago. They go through a period of giantism, and he then proceeds to show the group an example of one of the giant fe uh, femurs from a species that has been called Homo heidelbergensis. And so Berger says, they are huge. That's so big, we can't even calculate how big this individual was. You would need an NBA basketball player to get someone of the height someone like this would have been, something like over seven feet tall. So these are enormous fossils. They don't even know. They can't even tell for sure how big these guys would have been. He surmises over seven feet tall. So Smith responds to Berger and says, could this extreme size just be some kind of weird quirk, just an abnormality? And Berger says, no, because we found a lot of them. Everywhere we find them, we find them enormous. These are what we call archaic homo sapiens. And so notice they're homo sapiens. They're just old. Uh, some people refer to them as Homo heidelbergensis. These individuals are extraordinary. They are giants. And so notice, first of all, that he acknowledges, again, they're humans. These are Homo sapiens, but they're just old, and they're really big. 
And uh, so they're giant-like, and this is not just some weird abnormality. There seem to be possibly a race of these guys. Now, if Homo hydrobergensis isn't big enough for you, back in 1944, Rolf von Koenigswald of the Netherlands Indies Geological Survey found some enormous jawbones. Time magazine ran an article announcing the discovery. Notice the uh, title of the article, Giants in Those Days, quoting from Genesis 6-4. Koenigswald first found a big jawbone which looked more human than Pithecanthropus's, but was so massive that he thought it could not possibly be a man's. Then he found a still larger jaw, the biggest ever discovered, which was unmistakably human. It was apparently the most primitive, truly human fossil ever discovered. Koenigswald named it Meganthropus paleojavanicus. All right, and that wasn't the end. Uh, Koenigswald's crowning find dwarfed even Meganthropus. He found three astounding teeth. They were six times as big as a modern man's molars. Weidenreich is sure from the pattern of their biting surfaces that they are definitely human. He has named this man monster Giganthropus. Weidenreich now believes that gigantism and massiveness may have been a general or at least widespread character of early mankind. So evidence of enormous humans, and it's possible that these aren't all necessarily references to the biblical giants like Goliath and, uh, and his ilk. I would hypothesize that in, in the, that the ancient world, especially pre-flood, would have been more conducive to a larger size all around. So you already see larger plants, insects. I didn't have time to even show you some of the fossils on that. And then you also have, of course, your reptiles, your large dinosaurs and so forth. But it's possible the humans also were much larger, which is what Weidenreich is actually suggesting. So maybe, maybe not. But notice again, we have scientific evidence that verifies the Bible's predictions and helps to substantiate the creation model. And if the fossil evidence isn't good enough, then we can look around today and even see examples of extremely large people, even though we're now thousands of years beyond the optimal period of human health and longevity. The professional wrestler, Andre the Giant, died in 1993, and he was a a mere seven feet, four inches tall, and we called him a giant, that he was short compared to the tallest man alive today, Sultan Kosin, who's eight feet, three inches tall. His immense height seems to have come as a result of a pituitary condition, which resulted in an overproduction of growth hormone. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest man in medical history that has been reliably confirmed was Robert Vodlow, died in 1940, measuring in at 8 feet 11 inches. This guy is 9 feet tall, weighed 491 pounds at one point. So the giants of the Bible are not mythical beings. These are real humans, albeit big ones. All right, number 20, if the flood happened, we'd predict that stories from such a cataclysmic event would be preserved as ancient oral traditions or in writings. Since the flood would have been before the time when possibly writing was even occurring, then these stories would have initially been passed down orally by word of mouth. And so you'd expect there to be similarities between the stories, but you wouldn't expect them to be exactly the same. And likely there would have been distortions that would have been made over the millennia in the same way distortions are made as we talk about amazing things that have happened to us and the way those get passed down. Sure enough, there are over 250 legends across the world about an ancient great flood. Here's just a few of those. In Greece, Zeus wanted to destroy humans with a flood and start over. Deucalion and his wife are put in a large wooden chest, and then a flood comes that covers almost all of the mountain peaks. In Babylon, you have Utnapishtim. He's warned by a god to build a boat in preparation for a terrible flood. He covers the boat with pitch, brings animals of all kinds and provisions, sent out a dove to see if the flood had receded, then a swallow, then a raven, which didn't return. They left the boat and worshiped their gods. Uh, The Toltec Indians tell of a great flood that destroyed the first world 1,716 years after creation, actually very close to the genealogies in Genesis 5. A few people escaped in a closed chest. Whenever I was doing creation work in uh, Arizona, I heard another one among the from the Anasazi Indians. Uh, In China, you have the Nasu, 
God sent messengers, a messenger to tell three sons of a, of a flood, Dom listened, ironically, and built a wooden boat. And then a huge flood came that, that covered the whole earth. Dom was saved and had three sons that then repopulated the earth. So amazing similarities. They don't match the Bible, of course, perfectly. But if they did match, you'd suspect there might have been some collusion at some point. In the books, the, the discovery of Genesis and Genesis and the mystery Confucius couldn't solve. Nelson even argues that the origin of the Chinese word for boat is actually comprised of the ancient forms of the words for vessel, eight, and mouth, or people. And so there, the idea that the word for boat actually came from uh, the flood. So Nelson makes the case for several other Chinese words being traced back to the flood, the Tower of Babel, and even creation. And he also argues from historical evidence that the Chinese were originally monotheistic, which of course you'd expect everybody to begin monotheistic. Again, over 250 legends of a major flood and the resemblances to Scripture in many cases is very notable, just as you'd expect to be the case if the flood happened and that was passed down. In light of the catastrophic nature of the flood, as well as the drastic change in lifespans after the flood, we'd predict that during and after the flood, for a period of time, there would probably be evidence of irregular rates for geologic processes that today are constant and slow, like nuclear decay rates, uh, the movement of the tectonic plates of the crust, uh, tree ring growth, ice layer formations in the, uh, in the uh, polar ice caps. And some of this uh, I've already alluded to, and some of it we'll discuss in our next session. So let's move on to number 22. We'd predict evidence that catastrophism, so rapid burial from catastrophes rather than uniformitarianism, we predict that catastrophism explains much of the geologic column, especially the fossils. And we, um, we've already looked at evidence of polystrate fossils, but you also have dinosaur graveyards that cover the entire planet. Uh, and I actually did some dinosaur excavation in one of these in Wyoming, where there's over 30,000 dinosaur fossils thought to be from some 5,000 dinosaurs that were uh, not only drowned uh, and buried, but actually torn to little bits like smithereens. These guys were obliterated by the power of, of the flood that was occurring over there in the west as, um, as probably the Rocky Mountains are forming. Uh, many fossils show evidence of rapid burial, which requires catastrophic conditions, as you'd expect if the flood happened. Notice this fish is in the middle of his dinner uh, when he gets quickly buried. This ichthyosaur, can you tell what he's in the middle of doing when he gets killed? Uh, actually, it's not a he. <laughs> That is a female giving birth whenever he gets, she gets hit. Uh, these dinosaur fossils show a typical posture that the dinosaur fossils are found in. So, you know, usually you don't find a dinosaur already fully like in, intact and articulated where all the bones are in the position of that the, that the creature, how the creature lived, its actual anatomical structure. Usually you find isolated bones. But if you find them where they are articulated, it's very common for them to be found in this death pose. Found in sediments, understood to be deposited by water, their heads thrown back, their tails curve forward, sometimes with their mouths open as though they're drowning and gasping for air. And this posture is called the epistatonic death posture and is understood to be due to death by water. Again, catastrophic activity as we'd expect. Numbers 23 through 26 concern the fossil record. So number 23, we would predict that when fossils first appear, they should be fully functional with no evolutionary history uh, tying them back to some single-celled organism. Now this prediction has been verified beyond a doubt in the fossil record and is even conceded by the evolutionary community. When you look at the geologic column, starting at the very bottom and moving up, so moving from further back in history to nearer in history. You're going along at the very bottom and you don't see many fossils at all through the Precambrian strata. And then all of a sudden there is this explosion of fully formed life with no evolutionary history and it's already extremely diverse the first time they actually 
appear in the fossil record. So evolution has called this explosion of fully functional species, the Cambrian explosion, and they cannot deal with it. They don't have an explanation. Stephen Jay Gould spent the bulk of his life trying to figure out how to answer this from an evolutionary perspective. So notice what Richard Dawkins said about this issue. The Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups, and we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. So not good news for the evolutionists. It's exactly what we predict to be the case if uh, the biblical flood model is true, and that's what the evidence has borne out. Of course, you know, young people, you're not going to hear about any of that in school. But the evidence is out there. Unfortunately, you have to dig deep into evolutionary literature to find it. Number 24, number 25, evolutionary theory would predict that uh, the fossils in the lowest strata would be simpler, so closer to the single-celled organisms that everything supposedly came from, Trilobites are considered to be representative of the Cambrian strata down at the bottom of the fossil record. And then as you move higher in the column, the fossils should, from an evolutionary perspective, be becoming more complex as they move towards human. All right, so in the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate, Bill Nye even argued that you never see higher organisms mixing with the lower organisms. And if you did, you could change the world because you would disprove evolution. Well, the truth is the trilobite, which again is representative of the lowest strata where, where of the Cambrian explosion, this creature is not even a lower animal. This is not simple as evolutionary theory would predict. It's considered one of the first creatures to have evolved and therefore it should be extremely simple, but it's not. It's extremely complex. The eye of the trilobite, scientists now know, was equipped with aplanatic lenses. These are dual lenses as opposed to the human eye, which is equipped with a single refractive lens. So scientists acknowledge the trilobite's eye is even more complex than the human eye. Any other eye we know of, it allowed them to be able to see on the bottom of the ocean in murky water. And so the, the trilobite is evidence against the evolutionary model and what you'd predict. How about the fossil of a mammal with a dinosaur in its stomach? that was found. So mammals like that aren't supposed to even be around with the dinosaurs, and yet clearly you have them living together. How about the existence of so-called living fossils, like the coelacanth? These are creatures that are, were thought to be extinct, ancient creatures that, that went on and evolved into other things or went extinct. And so you find them lower in the fossil record, and then they totally disappear. Then all of a sudden they find them today alive. And so this proves that just because you don't see fossils of a certain creature in the, in the record, that doesn't mean that that creature wasn't already in existence and living at the time. All right, so the evolutionary model would struggle with these kind of anomalies because they contradict the predictions of evolution and therefore falsify evolution. But these are what we would predict to be the case. Creationists would have to argue, uh, we would argue that just because something's lower it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's more primitive or simple because this isn't, we don't explain this from evolutionary perspectives. Uh, since all kinds of creatures were originally created fully functional and perfect in the beginning, you'd expect a diversity of simplicity and complexity all over the place from the start when you have fossilization beginning. So whether or not a fossil is found lower as opposed to higher in the, in the geologic column is going to be due to other factors. Mainly, when was it buried in the flood? So in general, the fossil record appears to reflect the progression of the flood. So if the flood came from the ocean, which is what seems to be alluded to in Genesis 7:11, the first creature you would expect to be buried would be creatures that are on that live on the uh, the base of the ocean, the ocean floor. Sure enough, that's what you find. The next thing you'd expect to be buried would be your fish. And then as the flood moved towards uh, the coast, you'd expect to start picking up your creatures that live along the coast, like your amphibians, and then ultimately your reptiles after that, as you start moving a little bit further inland. That is exactly what you find in the, uh, in the fossil record. It's exactly what we'd predict to be the case. So the fossil record isn't a record of how creatures lived in the past over millions of years. It's how they died in the flood rapidly. It's not a record of life, it's a record of death, it is a graveyard. 
Uh, other factors, of course, play, uh, play in as well in trying to uh, understand what's going on in, in some specific cases in the fossil record. But the bottom line is that the fossil record appears to match exactly what we'd expect to happen with the progression of the flood, and it causes some major problems for the evolutionary model. Concerning number 26, we'd predict uh, fossil graveyards if the flood happened, and of course, again, they're all over the world. Uh, fossil graveyards are clear examples of places where you've got entire herds of animals that are caught and unable to escape some kind of cataclysmic fossil forming event that involved a lot of water. Uh, now, what in the world would that be? In fact, uh, what I was studying in Wyoming with those apparently 5,000 dinosaurs, they were all buried. The, the, the evidence is clear. I could take an entire session talking about this. The evidence is clear that they were killed and destroyed, ripped into shreds by a single catastrophic event. This wasn't multiple ones. This was a single event that killed them all and buried them all together. Now, what in the world would have enough power to kill 5,000, not little mice, but dinosaurs? We're talking Triceratops, Edmontosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, Pachycephalosaurus. These are the kind of uh, creatures that are buried out there. How does it kill these guys, tear them to shreds, and dump them in this, uh, in this ranch in Wyoming? Uh, well, that's something pretty cat catastrophic. Obviously, that's not a very uniform process. All right, number 27, sedimentary rock is understood to, by geologists to usually be formed within bodies of water. So if the flood occurred, you'd expect sedimentary rock would be very prevalent on the earth, especially in the layers we understand to have been deposited by the flood. And sure enough, they are. They are the most common rocks exposed on the surface of the earth. They make up 75% of the surface rocks. They're even on mountains. Uh, number 28, we'd predict that seismites will likely be found if the flood, and specifically catastrophic plate tectonics that I talked about last time is true. Seismites are layers of sediment that uh, are known to form. These are rock layers that are made from like sand that, have been, that has been wet, and they're known to form during earthquake activity. So layers of sediment that are underwater, maybe shaken by an earthquake, will leave behind little volcanoes in the sediment where the, where the water uh, was trying to escape. And so it leaves these structures in, the, in this kind of sedimentary rock that are called fluid evulsion structures. So then if that rock, if that sediment lithifies, so it turns to stone, then it's called a seismite layer. And so major earthquakes today are known to create small seismites on the order of inches thick. Well, in 2014 and 2016, I had the opportunity to go hunt for seismites out in Wyoming. And, uh, and these are in rock layers that are understood to have been formed towards the end of the flood. And we found seismites all right, but these are not uh, inches thick. These are feet thick, uh, 15 feet or more in some cases. So this is proof of large amounts of water in that area. Again, this is where the dinosaurs are being wiped out. Uh, Wyoming being underwater, and this is proof of enormous, never heard of earthquakes that humans have never experienced. Only Noah and his family would have known about them and survived, and they were up on the, on the top of the water at the time and probably did not know they were going on. Uh, but these uh, could have been the quakes that are, that are occurring uh, as the uh, oceanic plate of the, of the Pacific Ocean is smashing into the west coast and forming the Rocky Mountains over there. You would expect these kind of seismites to be forming. Numbers 29 and 30, if the creation model is true and the incident at the Tower of Babel is true, we'd expect there to be evidence that that, that, that event happened through, for example, stories that were passed down through the millennia, just like uh, is the case with the flood and with uh, dinosaurs. In the flood legend of the Toltec Indians, in the legend, uh, after um, the survivors left this chest, they wandered the earth until they found a place to build a zaquali, a high tower, in case another flood came. And during that time period, their languages were confused and they spread out over the earth. Uh, the Miaotzu people of China they have a flood legend where it poured for 30 days, and then there were 55 days of drizzle that covered the mountain ranges. Nuwa and his family and animals were saved in a wide boat, and a bird was sent out, sacrifices were made. The survivors made cities, spoke the same language. They built a very high tower, which was wrong, and then God mixed their language. They weren't able to finish the city and tower. They separated 
over the earth. Dan Landis documents other examples. In the Burmese legend, the people built a pagoda to try to reach the heavens, and their god came down angrily and confused their languages and caused them to spread out. In the Congo, instead of building a tower, the people balanced themselves on poles. In the uh, Mexican version, they built a tower out of clay. In India, it was demons, and they built an altar to the sky and were thwarted by the sky god. Uh, Africa, Greece, the Assam people, many have a story about this great structure being built into the sky, and then the language is being confused so that the people had to be spread out. And as with the flood legends, the details don't match in some of the particulars, but you wouldn't expect them to match since the traditions would have been passed down orally for centuries. And if they did match, you'd think there might have been some kind of collusion. But the common thread of an ancient, uh, of a, some kind of ancient incident involving a god, a tall structure, and the confusion of languages is a common theme that would be predicted based on the flood model. All right, we'll cover number 30 our very last prediction in our uh, next session. So the creation model, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just an unscientific model. We can't make any verifiable predictions, so just give it up and go home. I don't know what you're even doing here. <laughs> right? You all paying attention? Everybody awake? All right, so Bill Nye and those like him are wrong. The creation model is able to make scientific predictions. Not a problem. All right, so I wish I could, could talk a lot. I could talk a lot more about all this, but... Uh, we are out of time, There's, and uh, in our next session, we're going to look at, I remember we're building this tower. We looked at the existence of God. We looked at how do you know which God exists? Uh, how do you know that the Bible's inspired? What does the actual creation model teach? Is it a valid model? The next plank I want to cover in our next session, which will be two weeks, will be is the creation model robust? Is it, is it able to be defended against modern attacks from scientists like Bill Nye, for example, and we'll find that it's able to do that. And in fact, in its ability to defend itself, it ends up providing that much more evidence that substantiates that the Bible is true about all these things. All right. I definitely need to drink some water. I was talking very fast to get all this in. Appreciate your attention tonight. And I will turn it back over to Matt. You coming up here or somebody else? Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for your preparation and study. That's good stuff. I, I, kind of, I think Charles Darwin would be blown away by all the discoveries that have been made since his death. I'm not sure he would even hold to his own theory at this point. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for creating us. We thank you for the word that tells us what you have done and, and what you want us to do and your purpose for our lives. Thank you for the time we've had this evening to be reminded of the truthfulness of your word and to build our faith up. Be with us now as we go our separate ways, and we pray that all of us will be blessed this week. Continue to be with us and take care of us as you always do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.